Hello my friends. So as I have stated on this channel many times, there are two categories of hair loss treatments. First you have the anti-androgens, and these work by lowering androgens like dihydrotestosterone, DHT on the scalp. And these include both direct anti-androgens like Fluoridil, RU584, uh, Brizula, and it also includes indirect anti-androgens that lower scalp DHT via the 5A reductase pathway, such as finasteride, dutasteride, episteride, and alpha -tradiol. Now. Having an anti-androgen is, of course, essential and should be the first step for long-term success in fighting hair loss since it's androgens, namely DHT, that cause hair loss in individuals who have androgenic alopecia. But in addition to anti-androgens, the second category you have are growth stimulants that work to grow the hair without influencing androgen levels. Now, the most famous and most proven clinically effective of these treatments is, of course, minoxidil, which is widely available in most regions of the world, and it's often over the counter, and since it is off patent, you can usually buy it as a cheaper generic variant, which makes it a reliably obtainable growth stimulant for most people. Also, it is the only growth stimulant to be FDA approved, which means that its safety and efficacy are supported by hundreds of millions of dollars worth of clinical research across several clinical trials involving thousands of test subjects. Of course, being that minoxidil is the only FDA approved hair growth stimulant, other hair growth stimulants on the market are not going to have the same plethora of research, but the there are other growth stimulants in the market with some evidence-based research to back up their efficacy. Uh, these would include things like stemoxidine, radensil, adenosine, and also minoxidil derivatives like copexyl, aminexyl, and nanoxidil. Now, the former two minoxidil derivatives have never been proven to be any more effective than just 2% minoxidil, but the latter mentioned nanoxidil has been brought up as of recently as the marketing suggests it is like minoxidil but better. So I want to look at some of the research behind those claims and see if it holds up to any kind of scientific scrutiny. So what is nanoxidil? Nanoxidil is the active ingredient in a product called spectral.dnc-n. Doesn't that just roll off the tongue? It's sold by a company called BS, excuse me, I mean DS Laboratories, which is probably most famous uh, in the hair loss community for selling a really crappy shampoo called Revita. Now, if you're not familiar with Revita, it is a ketoconazole shampoo, kind of like Nizril, and ketoconazole shampoos are often mentioned as being beneficial for hair loss, even though the evidence behind this is pretty weak. I actually created a video on that a couple months ago. If you want to know more about that, you can go ahead and watch it. But what is supposed to make Revita special is that it has a bunch of other ingredients in it that are supposed to moisturize the hair and help counteract the dryness that uh, Nizoril causes. But having used it personally, I find that it is just as drying, if not more drying, than even 2% prescription Nizoril shampoo. And it's a lot more expensive than Nizoril. So if you want to use a ketoconazole shampoo, you might as well just use Nizoril. I mean, you can counter some of the dryness of a ketoconazole shampoo by just putting a teaspoon of jojoba oil in your conditioner and just letting it sit for five minutes in the shower. And also, Revita has very uh, has used deceptive marketing in the past. Like for for instance, they have said it is free of animal testing, yet at the same time, it has emu oil in it. You have to kill the emu bird to extract the fat and turn it into emu oil. So it seems very sleazy to bring up the lack of animal testing because why would that be so virtuous if they're already killing an animal to make the product to begin with? So I'd recommend just using Nizoril instead if you want to use a ketoconazole shampoo, which I don't necessarily think is necessary. I mean, you still have the active ingredient ketoconazole. I mean, you'll just end up saving money and you won't be killing any innocent emo birds. But anyways, I'm getting off topic, so let's get back to the subject of nanoxidil. So... We know nanoxidil is a minoxidil derivative sold by DS Laboratories, and it's found in the product spectral.dnc-n, but what is so different about it? Well, from a purely chemistry point of view, there is very little different about it. I mean, as you can see here, the only difference is that they just took out one carbon atom from minoxidil, so the lower ring hexagon becomes a pentagon of carbon atoms. The rest of the molecule is exactly the same. So this tells us minoxidil is very similar to minoxidil, but we cannot determine if it's more effective or more side effect friendly without an actual study. Now, fortunately, there are a couple studies on the drug we can work with. So. 
The first study ever done on ninoxidil was from 2009 in Korea, and it was performed on mice. Now, naturally, I don't want to spend too much time on animal studies because you really need human studies to confirm the veracity of animal data, but it's worth noting that in this study that the mice who received 5% ninoxidil showed accelerated hair growth compared to mice just getting a normal saline solution or 50% alcohol solution. So the study indicated that ninoxidil is effective at hair growth in mice, and therefore it's worth looking at in humans which brings us to the first and so far only human study. So, this study on humans was published in 2019, and it looked at 49 women with female pattern hair loss. The 49 patients were treated with spectral.dnc-n for three months, and 28, a patient, uh, 28 patients remained on treatment for an additional three months. The effectiveness of the treatment was assessed in several different ways. First of all, the hair growth was assessed by patients and the investigators using a 10-point visual scale looking at hair type and length. They also assessed hair density and hair diet Diameter, uh, hair diameter uh, using phototrichograms, which they can use to uh, accurately uh, measure the assessment of uh, both of those things. Finally, the tolerance and satisfaction of the treatment was assessed with patient questionnaires. Now, in this study, they did not just look at pure 5% ninoxidil like they looked at 5% minoxidil during the FDA clinical trials. This product also has a whole smorgasbord of theoretical treatments of them, some of which are backed by evidence and some of which aren't. Now, besides ninoxidil, this product also includes azelic acid, lysophosphatidic acid, copper tripeptides 1, myristoyl pentapeptide 17, adenosine, peroctonolamine, retinol, and finally, for good measure, they threw caffeine in there as well. So that's quite the witcher potion uh, they concocted there. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it also contains some green glowing unknown substance from the moon. But anyways, here is the problem with all this. If the study shows benefits, then we have no idea which of these substances is the effective ingredient or if the combination is effective. Also, we have no comparison with any existing treatments like minoxidil, which this product is marketed as being superior to. Finally, to add to the problem with this study design, there is no control group or placebo group, so even if we see benefit, we don't know if this, this is due to the treatment or just a placebo effect. The hair on your head, whether you have androgenic alopecia or not, goes through growth and resting phases, so without a control group, we can't exclude the possibility that the benefits the subjects experienced in the study weren't just the hair going through a cyclical growth phase. That is why you need a control group for this kind of research, no exception. Nevertheless, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. So, looking at the hair shedding score, there is a significant decrease in hair shedding both at three months and six months of treatment. In addition, the hair mass index, which was a measurement of both hair density and hair thickness, increased. So, they used this photographic assessment, and frankly, I don't see much of a difference cosmetically, and assuming this is the best they have to show for it, I'm not very impressed. Also, Another claim made in the study is that ninoxidil might cause less scalp irritation and itching than minoxidil, but what the study actually showed is that 25 out of 49 of the patients reported no itching at the end of the three months, and 18 out of 28 reported no itching after six months. That still means that close to a majority of patients still reported itching and scalp irritation, so on this metric alone, it seems ninoxidil isn't very good. Now, it is known minoxidil can cause scalp irritation and, and itching in some people too, but usually it isn't so bad that it can't be tolerated, and I doubt it happens to close to 50% of people who use it. Again, since this wasn't a comparison study with minoxidil, it is impossible to say that minoxidil has fewer side effects than minoxidil, so DS Laboratory shouldn't claim so. Finally, if we look at the disclosure of the study, one of the co-authors was a consultant for DS Laboratories who makes this product which contains dinoxidil. Another co-author was the Senior Vice President of Research and Development at DS Laboratories. In addition, this study was funded entirely by DS Healthcare, which is basically the same thing as uh, the DS Laboratories companies. So, you know, it's not too uncommon for studies on products to have some conflict of interest, but this is particularly bad because there's absolutely no independent research 
research done on this product in humans whatsoever. So of course they're going to conduct the research in a way that is most beneficial and that's probably why the methodology is so sketchy. Again, no control group, small sample sizes, uh, no comparison with existing products like minoxidil, and a treatment that is a hodgepodge of other potential treatments which makes any outcomes very difficult to interpret. Also, I should mention that even if some of the ingredients in this product besides minoxidil do have some clinical research, we can't assume that it will work as it's applied in this product because we don't know the dosages and we don't know how these substances interact with each other. It makes you wonder why didn't they just use pure minoxidil as a research chemical and compare it with minoxidil. I mean, if minoxidil were really superior to minoxidil, as they claim, then a really good randomized control trial would have proven that. I mean, any researcher will tell you that a randomized control trial is the gold standard for research, so why didn't they do such a trial on minoxidil alone without all these added ingredients? It makes me think they're actually not very confident in their product, hence why they had to conduct research in a way that delivers a positive outcome, even if the methodology is very poor. I mean, they know that most of their consumers are not going to be terribly scientifically illiterate. So any study they feed them that shows a positive outcome for their product, they know their consumers are going to eat up just because most will not be able to pick them apart the way I do. Now, if you're not convinced that this is a poor quality study, let's just take a look at a sample of the research on the minoxidil study. So here's a study of a, here's an example of a study done in 2004, again, looking at female pattern hair loss. In this study, they enrolled 381 women, and this was a 48 week double blind placebo controlled randomized multi-center study comparing the effectiveness and safety of 5% minoxidil versus 2% minoxidil versus placebo. You know, I'll go ahead and link the research below, but the outcome showed clear superiority of 5% minoxidil to 2% minoxidil and to placebo. And since it was just minoxidil, we know there are no confounding factors. And since there is a control group, we can rule out the possibility that the results were just due to chance. You can't say that about this minoxidil study. Uh, the methodology in the minoxidil studies blows this one out of the water, and it's an absolute joke that DS Labs would have the audacity to come to, to come to the conclusion that minoxidil is better than minoxidil based on such flimsy, poorly established research. But what about the people who say they have issues with minoxidil? I mean, is minoxidil going to be a superior alternative in that case? Well, the research already showed that nearly half of the subjects who use minoxidil still get skin irritation, so probably not. And minoxidil is chemically similar enough to minoxidil that any problems one would get with minoxidil, they'll probably get with nanoxidil as well. I mean, if you do have problems with minoxidil, it could be one of the inactive ingredients like propylene glycol. So if you do have issues, it may be good to not just assume you can't use minoxidil, but rather look into like uh, propylene glycol call free version of minoxidil. I mean, I know Lipogain sells one and there are others as well. Now, some people may respond very well to minoxidil, though they may look at minoxidil and think they can stack minoxidil with minoxidil for added benefit. But a problem arises in the fact that minoxidil is already very similar to minoxidil. The only difference is just one carbon atom after all, so you probably wouldn't get any synergistic benefits from using both in the same way you'd get like a synergistic benefit from using finasteride and minoxidil since those two work completely different. But but if you did want to stack two hair growth stimulants together, it would probably be better to use something like stemoxidine with minoxidil because stemoxidine is a hair growth stimulant, but it works completely differently from minoxidil as in it works to shorten the telogen resting phase of the hair follicle as opposed to prolonging the antigen growth phase like minoxidil does. And thus the two can theoretically be stacked together. Although for most people, I think this is probably unnecessary and overkill. I mean, we know the gold standard for hair loss continues to be a finasteride and minoxidil stacked. I mean, it has been like this for decades, and for most of us, this is all we will ever really need. And for a lot of us, uh, many of us may just need finasteride alone. I mean, that continues to be a good standalone treatment for many people. Now, I have nothing against seeing companies trying to innovate uh, with new products, but it doesn't do consumers any good to introduce products as alternatives to FDA-approved treatments using such poorly conducted research. I mean, not to mention, this is all a, also a very expensive treatment treatment compared to minoxidil. I mean, a bottle of spectral.dnc-n is 60 milliliters and it costs 38 US dollars. I mean, I can go to Target and buy three 30 milliliter bottles of minoxidil for just 20 US dollars. So it's clear what DS Laboratories is trying to do here. I mean, they don't want to use minoxidil in their product because then they'd have to justify charging so much more than just generic minoxidil. So instead, they use their own variation minoxidil and claim it's superior despite lacking strong evidence to justify that claim. But now they can get away with charging so much 
much more because, you know, it's like minoxidil, but better, and they know that their consumers won't be able to break down the research behind it, and they'll just trust whatever garbage they print out. So, I know people by their nature are always going to find interest in what is new and what is hot, but the fact is that even though minoxidil is old, it's been around since the 1980s, it is still the best kind of hair growth stimulant, and being that it is cheap and widely available, there is no reason to use minoxidil over minoxidil. I mean, if you're allergic or sensitive to minoxidil, then you probably won't respond well to minoxidil either, in which case you may want to consider a different hair growth stimulant like, uh, like stamoxidine. Now, we all know DS Laboratories and their marketing. They have uh, very nice packaging and they have slick advertisements uh, for their products, but that will never hold a candle to quality research. And on that ground, minoxidil absolutely demolishes minoxidil. So my recommendation is to just stick with where the research is. I mean, your hair is far too important to leave to unproven therapies. I mean, after all, you may not get a second chance because not everybody can afford a hair transplant. So... All right, folks, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up and continue to feed my addiction to video games by playing more Crash Bandicoot 4. Until then, I'll see you guys next time. Take care.